We are back for another episode of Made for Philly. I am Bryce Zielinski alongside Matt Minton. We are presented by Godzilla Media. Matt, it feels good. We finally got back into the win column, although, albeit, it was pretty ugly. Uh, but the birds are 2-3. and three. We will get to that. We will break down our thoughts on the Eagles-Panthers game. We will obviously break down the big game tonight between the Eagles and Bucks. Obviously, you want to get that episode in as we drop it on Thursdays because tonight is the big game. And then, obviously, we have to talk about shithead returning. And by shithead, I mean Ben Simmons. He Who is else? back in town, and he is ready to rock all of a sudden. And he, so we obviously have to talk about that and the future of him with this team and what it means for the Sixers heading into 2021. And then, with a little time left, we will obviously talk the orange and black. Their season starts Friday out in Vancouver, so we will break down their roster and give our thoughts on where and how far possibly the Flyers can go. But first things first, Matt, let's talk. Let's talk the two and three birds. Obviously, it was not pretty uh, by any stretch, but a win is a win. The Eagles are two and three. Yeah, definitely not a pretty mean by any stretch. But when you look at the situation, any win is a good win for this young team that's with a young coach trying to figure out his way in the NFL. and to go against a pretty good Carolina team to start the year in their own territory. So I do think that there is more good than bad to take. Obviously still not a lot of stuff we like to see. Like obviously the safety, don't get me started on that. Still <laughs> trying to file a missing person report for Miles Sanders. Don't know what's going on with him, but we got him a little bit more involved towards the end, but still some overall questionable decisions, but a win is a win, especially when you've got the rest of your, the next couple games of your schedule coming up on a short week with Tampa Bay was really good for them to get this win in. Yeah, you you kind of knew this was not a must win game, but a must win game for the Eagles. You can't go one and four coming back home and playing the Bucks. That's mm -hmm. just that's just a recipe to set the season on a downward spiral. We talked to, we talked about that last week, but good things happen when you keep playing hard. And as awful as the Eagles looked in the first half and all three phases of the game they did keep playing hard and they were able to end that three game losing streak and grind out a win Sunday and sometimes that's what you have to do they're not all going to be pretty uh they fell behind 13 to 3 and the Eagles outscored the Panthers 18 to 5 the rest of the game getting themselves that ugly but desperately needed 21 to 18 win down in Charlotte the one thing we're starting to learn Matt is that Jalen Hurts is no matter how bad things are going, the kid keeps his head up, stays positive, and keeps fighting. You at least have to give that to him. He looked horrible for about three and a half quarters on Sunday. But the last final drives, he got this team. I mean, obviously, they got big help by the block uh, that set them up with the short field. But after it was all said and done, he put this team in a position to win. And we sure saw that on Sunday. Awful in the first half. No question. Uh, Sirianni once again didn't give him uh, too many favors with the horrible play calling yet again. Like you said, file missing persons report for Miles Sanders. Run the damn ball. We know where they're not going to. We'll talk about it in a little bit. But you know they're not going to change this week against the Bucs. The Eagles' first 11 drives resulted in six punts, two turnovers, a safety, and two field goals. Um, Hertz was taking shots. The offensive line wasn't really holding up, but he kept fighting, kept battling and was able to shake off a lot of adversity in this game. I think this was the first time you kind of saw him bounce back with adversity. It, it kind of seemed like so far with Hertz, if things have not gone right, they weren't going to go right the entire game. This was kind of that growth you want to see from him. Not every game's going to be pretty and in the NFL, you're going to face adversity every week. That's the bottom line. And if your quarterback has the ability to work through it, that's huge. This was a big step for Jalen uh, in the evaluation of franchise QB. Yeah, so I'll start up and uh, touch up with kind of reflect on what you said with Hurts in terms of accountability. It's like I said, he's going to do give you his end of the bargain when it comes to this big second year for him. And the way he's a lot of – he's still a rookie in a lot of a way. I don't even know if he started, you know, technically half of a season yet with – the games, I think it was actually about eight. What's that? Was his eighth start, I believe? Because yeah, four, four yeah, last year, four yeah. last year, and now that was four, four. No, that was so, five. That was five. That so was nine. five. Okay, so roughly about halfway, you know, half of a regular season. There is still 
obviously some concern, like, you know, all the accountability in the world doesn't really matter if you're not able to improve upon it, but it was nice to see him make those adjustments and really take charge in a situation. Really, that was a game the Eagles had no business in being in, but he still he None. still willed that team down there. Granted, it wasn't pretty, but he got him to the end zone. And that's what you do want to see from a franchise quarterback. Again, like every game so far, there were a couple of throws that he missed that a franchise quarterback should make. But the mentality, as we know, is still there. And we are hoping to see him continue to make those strides. So I think Tampa, that defense is going to be a huge test for him. <laughs> so this next couple of weeks are really going to really where we're going to be starting to see, in my opinion, what he's got. Before we go to the defensive performance of last week, we can't go and let Sirianni off the hook. Ignored the run game for much of the afternoon, and I just have to – why did it take so long for the Eagles offense to start rolling? Because Sirianni's play calling was so out of whack, it really gave Hurts and the offense absolutely no chance to succeed. The first half, the Eagles ran 29 plays. Matt, I, I mean, I sound like a broken record. Four of those plays were runs. I mean, seriously, Sirianni, what what the hell are we doing here? He started dialing up some late runs in the game because he didn't have a choice, but the first three quarters, the backs were six for 19 in the first three quarters. Nuts. Six rushing attempts for 19 yards. Fourth quarter, they were seven for 42, and you see what happened. They pulled back and, and won the game. Um, this is a Panthers team going into that game. They ranked 23rd in the NFL in run defense. I mean, there was a clear weakness that this team could give up the run. This was a game that you could build some momentum. And when Miles Sanders got the ball in his hands, he was effective. He mm -hmm. was effective. And I, you could bitch about him running out of bounds. But, I mean, you, you <laughs> come on. That's nitpicking at this point. I was just, just happy to see, the ball. I was just happy to see him get the ball. Sirianni got away with ignoring the run game on Sunday. But, I, I mean, Matt, this is – this is insanity. This is asinine that week after week after week, I mean, you may as well not have running backs on this team. There is no run game plan, and how am I supposed to ex expect it to change against the Buccaneers who have probably the best defensive front seven in all of football? I mean, I mean, come on. you got to establish the run to take some of the pressure off Jalen Hurts, and if you run the ball and you commit to it, things are going to open up. Sirianni refuses to do it. It is mind-blowing. Yeah. Look, I think I said this last week, too. One of the Chargers coaches talked about establishing the running game to bring in the physical element of the game. Because when you're running the ball, you're forcing everybody to the ball and you're forcing the defense to make tackles. Necessarily, when you're dropping back 40 to 50 times in the game, you're not make, you're not causing this defense to have to play physical and come up and make tackles, giving a completion if the ball is just thrown away. So running the ball is really the key to opening up, especially when you have a quarterback who – in two years has started half of a full season. You need to back him up with some running games and you have the backs to do it. You got Miles Sanders. Kenny Gamewell has shown what he can be out of the backfield as a receiving back. You still got Jordan Howard on the practice squad who granted, I don't know how much he's got left, but he does give you that physical ability. If you want to add a fourth running back to the rosters, I think they only have three on the roster right now, which is also mind blown. Cause you know, you think you have a minimum of four. Some teams carry five they, in certain situations. They, I mean, they, they have, they have miles, they have Gainwell, they have Boston Scott, who, I mean, is, is he alive? Is he, does he actually know. exist? I only know um, he's made a snap. Maybe he's gotten one carry so far this year, but in this situation, especially when your offense, Sirianni is, is revolved around a lot of play action passes and RPOs. If you're not handing the ball off, no defense in their right mind is going to fall for a play action pass or an RPO in that situation. It's just going to make it way harder for you. And you're going to have Jalen Hurts, who's dropping back 50 times a game, who is not a 50 time drop back. He's not Aaron Rodgers. He can't just drop back and make a play. You have to open up and work this offense out to him. And it starts with running the ball. Yeah. And it really is like so, so mind blowing that an offense that is centered around the RPO won't run the ball. The whole point about the RPO is to keep the defense on its toes, not knowing if the quarterback's going to keep it. Is it going to go to the running back? Is it going to be a quick pass? What are they going to do? But you got to run the ball for defenses to consider that as an option. They simply have it. Um, let's go to the defense real quick before we go to the Bucks game. Um, when the Panthers put up 10 points in the first quarter, I don't know about you, but I kind of had that here we go again feeling like the defense did not step up. It, it oh, wasn't absolutely. looking good, um, but they settled down. 
and played pretty much lights out the rest of the way, allowing just two field goals the rest of the game. Uh, this was a performance, Matt, I mean, especially going into such a tough matchup with the Bucs this week that they really needed. And, and one, Jonathan Gannon really needed to keep the heat off of him because, um, I, I mean, the, the city was ready to see him go up in flames as well. They only allowed 267 total yards. Um, the biggest thing that we talked about last week, Matt, was the lack of takeaways. They got three including Darius Slay having two, and then they had uh, Steven Nelson with one. They also had the block punt on special teams. They finally were making plays on third down and gave the offense chances to get its act together. That's the complimentary football that we saw in week one against the Falcons that we thought we were going to see more of. We finally got a taste of it again. Hopefully they can kind of build up on that and take that into the biggest game of the year so far. Yeah, it really was nice to see the defense have a bit of a wake up. I mean, Javon Hargrave is continuing to play, in my opinion, an all pro level. Six Fletcher sacks. Cox, six, six sacks, sacks already. five games. It's unbelievable for a defensive tackle. Fletcher Cox finally woke up and did something on the offense. Granted, you still had a lot of mistakes. And, uh, those two Alex Singleton personal fouls, you can't have that, especially for, but, you know, we don't see that a whole lot from him, but still, that's not going to win you a football game. But outside the quick 10 points they gave up, they were incredible. It was really great and refreshing to see, especially given the way they played the last couple of weeks. So, you know, by the end of that game, if they lost, I was going to say it wasn't the defense's fault. They settled down. They did their job. They got the takeaways, and they held a really solid Panthers offense to, mm -hmm. uh, like you said, under 300 yards of offense. Anytime where you can hold a team to under 300 total yards, you should be in position to win that game. They kept the team in position to win that game. and. It's going to be tough, but hopefully they can carry some momentum of that into the Tampa Bay game. Yeah, this was by far, Matt, I think the best game this year for the defensive line. And I would for say once, so. it, it, for once, it wasn't just Hargrave, to your point. Like, I mean, he did get his sixth sack, but they had terrific pressure from pretty much everybody. Um, and, and that made life difficult for Sam Darnold. And we just we we talked about that as our big key to the game last week was pressuring Sam Darnold and getting him on getting him uncomfortable because you see what happens. He turned the ball over three times um, and really did not look comfortable, did not have a good day at all. Bunch of incompletions. Um, Cox finally showed up. Like you said, Josh Sweat got a sack. Mm -hmm. Kerrigan made some plays, had a tackle for a loss as well. Um, they did allow Chuba Hubbard to go over 100 yards. That can't happen. But overall, this was the bounce back. Um, that you were looking for after just being brutal and giving up 86 mm -hmm. points the past two weeks before that. This is a performance you really needed to see. It was good to see Darius Slay finally pay off with his huge contract with that two interception game. Mm -hmm. Big play Slay. Big play Slay after not really being in the mm -hmm. Eagles fans' good graces after the Chiefs game. And uh, it, it seems like somewhat momentum is going the right way. I kudos to the linebackers as well. They have been absolutely abysmal, but I think Davion Taylor finally got the most playing time this year that he's gotten. And uh, he was really solid. And I think he needs to see this rotation more and more. I he agree. was better than Wilson, um, better than Singletary. Davion Taylor was making plays. Um, he was all over the field last Sunday. Like, cause you see the situation with Davion Taylor. I mean, I've always been really high on him. Grant, I understand he didn't play a lot of football, so you know he had to learn a lot differently. But when you look at this and the way your team is built with the lack of the linebacker position with veterans outside of really Eric Wilson, who's been up and down most of the season, Davion Taylor was one, a third-round pick for a reason, and he's probably by far your most athletic linebacker. When you look at his ability to cover both sides of the field, the only way you're really going to see what he's got is to play him and mix him into the rotation with these young group of guys who – you know, let's be honest, like, you know, how high is their own respective ceilings? I love Alex Singleton to death. He's got his file this team for as long as he wants a special team. But you got to ask, is he a starting caliber linebacker? And the way yeah, you he, find out. What's he's he kind of building off that, yeah. Yeah, and then what's Davion Taylor's ceiling? So you're only going to find out what his ceiling is if you let him see the floor outside of practice where you're, you know, because granted, all the drills in the world, all the sitting time in the world isn't going to mean squat if you're not actually on the field in full pads hitting another man in full pads. Yeah, and it feels like Singletary is kind of building, trying to build off of that very successful season last year where he was the Eagles' best linebacker, and he hasn't seemed to put it all together. But nonetheless, the Eagles have won. They're 2-3, and three, and that brings in 
the defending Super Bowl champions met on Thursday night football. Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, just what the doctor ordered after, you know, finally getting a win. Who else to spoil it but the best team in football, uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This is going to be a big game on both sides of the ball. Um, Let's start on the offensive side, though, because obviously that is what we have been talking about. Uh, Mostly what would be the play calling, would be how is Jalen Hurts going to rebound after not his best week. Um, This is a game where you kind of look at you know what the Eagles need to do and that's run the football. However, the Buccaneers strength is stopping the run run that is their run defense with the brutal front seven, a very extremely talented front seven led by uh, Dominican Sue, Vita Vea, William Golston. They have JPP, Devin White, Levante David, Shaq Barrett. It was really the reason why they won the Super Bowl last year and, and rattled Patrick Mahomes. Uh, When you look at the keys to this game, I mean, let's start on the offensive side of the ball and and let's let's look at these running backs. Is it necessarily going to be the game you're going to see uh, the Eagles run the ball? No, but Miles Gaskin last week for the Dolphins tore this Bucks defense up in Mm -hmm. terms of catching the ball out of the backfield in week five. Gaskin finished the game with 10 catches for 74 yards and two touchdowns. The scary part is he had six catches for 60 yards and one touchdown before Levante David left the game in the second quarter. So it's not like the Eagles were just checking down once David's injury occurred. Um, the Bucks will be without David on Thursday night, or the Dolphins, excuse me. Um, that's their best linebacker in coverage. I, I look at Kenny Gainwell and I look at Miles Sanders and I look at how can this team, how can this offense get more efficient on that side of the football, getting the running game going. If you could get these running backs catching balls out of the backfield, they have the speed to make guys miss. This could be a way that Sirianni could attack this Buccaneers. Very, very talented front seven. It really could. And like, there's no getting around it. The Bucks are probably the best all around put together team in football, but it doesn't change the fact that they are still human and that their team is exploitable. And we saw last week, if you're able to run the ball or utilize the running backs out of the backfield, you can find a way to march down the field. And granted, is it something Sirianni's going to do? I pro- As much as it pains me to say, I don't think so. We've seen the way <laughs> he's operated this offense so far. But, you know, if there was ever a time to start running the ball, like now, now is the time. It's like, do you remember um, – the year the Eagles went to the Super Bowl, where Doug avoided running the ball for a while until we finally had that big Laguerre Blunt game. Yep, it's time to, the Chargers. It's, yep. it's time to have that Chargers game right now against the Bucks because you're going to need to be able to wear their you're going to need to wear their front seven down. That starts with the run game, so that way when you do have Jalen Hurts dropping back, you need to be able to have these guys gassed. And if they know it's going to be a pass play every play, it's the Bucks. It's not going to help you out. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, the the Bucks are a tall, tall task. Um, and, and you know, if these back these running backs out of the backfield are going to be successful, if there is a chance the Eagles get this run game going, this Eagles offensive line, along with the offensive tackles, need to be playing well. Andre Dillard has been a pleasant surprise, I think, for most of us in 2021 after a really disappointing preseason. Hasn't really lived up to the hype. You haven't heard much about him, which is a good thing. That's what you want to hear about your your offensive line as he's held his own in three starts at left tackle. However, the Eagles offensive tackles remain a concern area with Dillard at left tackle. Obviously, Lane Johnson will not play again. We still do not know what is going on but he will miss his third game a lot. Uh, Jordan Mailata was forced to move to right tackle as a result of that absence, and he played serviceably on the right side. He's typically used to that left side, but, you know, Dillard is used to the left side and the infamous quote of, you know, make it forcing him to write with his right hand when you're left-handed quote from last year uh, didn't really sit well with the mm. Eagles. So Stoutland moved him to the left tackle and Mailata moved right. Um, they're going to be facing guys like Shaq Barrett, who led the NFL with 19 and a half sacks in 2019, had eight sacks last year and plus four more in the playoffs. You have JPP, who's, yeah, he might be off to a slow start this year, but he has averaged over 10 sacks per season in his three years in Tampa. So you know the talent's there. And then Joe Tryon Shoinka, 
I don't know if I'm saying that last name right, but it's a doozy. Tell you. First round pick for the Bucks, who has two sacks in five games. We all saw the Super Bowl. It was why the Bucks won. It was their pass rush. This is the strength of that team. This Eagles offensive line has the toughest task to date. It really is. And I, <laughs> and it just hurts me to have to say the key to doing this, no pun intended with hurts, by the way, the key to doing this is running the football, doing the one thing that your offense has not just flat out ignored for the past four week for the past five weeks. Well, tech, I guess for the most part, four they ran the ball a decent amount of times against Atlanta, but in a team the, like Atlanta game script was perfect, and then was. they it was done yeah, it again. It. Literally, if they come out with almost the exact same Atlanta script with just a few more run plays, they have the opportunity to exploit the Bucks because over the last couple of years, it seems like their losses have come in what could be considered trap games where they were supposed to win. But that doesn't matter to me at all. It starts with running the football and establishing that physical presence. Let your line get in sync and get into a rhythm early. So that way when Hurts is dropping back to play, keep up with the Bucks offense. The team knows what they're doing and he's more protected and the defense is more thrown off with an open playbook. I think, you know, obviously we talked about the, da- the talented pass rush and what Sirianni could do. Um, Jalen Hurts' mobility is going to come in to play in a big way this week. Uh, He's really enjoying a nice season through the first five weeks Um, on the ground. Specifically one part of his game that has really helped him succeed is that mobility. He's not your typical mobile quarterback. He's not Lamar Jackson. He's not going to be running all over the place. However, he can move around the pocket. He can escape the pocket. He can make plays out of the structure through the air, or it can gash whatever defense he's facing on the ground to set up, you know, and and extend plays, set up a favorable down and distance for the next play. Either way, the Bucs are going to look to figure out a way to contain Hertz when he does escape the pocket. Um, It's not going to be an easy task for them because Hertz is second among all quarterbacks with 253 rushing yards. Um, So this is something that I'm looking at as a big key, maybe to extend the plays if it starts to break down um, hurts to extend the play, maybe not run every time, but extend it because you look at these Eagles receivers versus what could be the weakness of this team defensively in the Buccaneers, which is their secondary. The Bucks are really thin at cornerback mm-hmm. with Carlton Davis and Sean Murphy, both on IR. And a couple of weeks ago, they brought in Richard Sherman. He started immediately and he he's been playing, which is blowing um, my mind. Right. And, and he, so he's their CB one. Uh, he was limited last year to a calf injury. Didn't really play. He started to show his age. Um, he was targeted uh, 29 times in 2020, gave up 21 catches. Uh, so it, it hasn't been good for him. So in two games so far this year with the Bucks, he's given up 11 completions on 14 targets for 139 yards. Pro football reference has him down for a couple of missed tackles as well. If there's a weak link on this Bucks defense, this is it. You saw Kez Watkins break for a big play last week. Mm-hmm. I think he deserves to play more than Jalen Rager at this point because Rager, look, no Rager looks lost. Um, and, and Devontae Smith really bounced back after a tough fumble. He's looking good. He's looking more comfortable mm-hmm. within this offense. Chris Brout running. It's only a matter of time until he starts exploding. Um, but those two guys – as well as Dallas Goddard and Zach Ertz. If Goddard plays, he's on the COVID list right now. We don't know if he's actually going to play, but these are guys that I'm looking at to have a big day. Yeah, going back to what you said about Richard Sherman and (laughs) sort of his age, he still is one of the smartest cornerbacks in the game. He still understands the game really well, but we even saw in the Super Bowl when it was Niners Chiefs how he was able to be almost taken out of the game plan with deep routes and able to be burnt down the field. So this is an opportunity where you have guys like Quez Watkins who can flare down the field. Maybe even Jalen Rager can sneak a big play in there. Devontae Smith, if he's able to utilize a double move, you can exploit this batted uh, buck secondary. But going back again, it starts with running the football and opening up the playbook. Because if they know it's going to be a pass play 90% of the time, they're going to be ready for it, and it's going to be harder to exploit. Yeah, I, I mean, look, this is, this is a team that really, really just needs – needs to be more consistent and more balanced in the play calling. I, I mean, you look at Jason Kelsey, he's going to have a tall task inside with uh, Vita Vey and Dominic and Sue. Mm-hmm. Um, this is going to be a tough task for this offensive line to keep Hertz's, uh, you know, Hertz upright really and to be able to extend those plays for the receivers to get open because I think they will. And I think Miles Sanders is going to be involved 
a little more, especially with the injuries to the linebacker position. I do look at Kez Watkins as well. I think he is going to break out for some big plays as well. Um, before we head to the defensive side of the ball, though, obviously we have to pick out our standout stars. On offense, Matt, if the Eagles offense is going to be clicking, which I have a feeling they are going to be able to put up the points. Um, it's just going to be a matter of can they keep up with the Buccaneers offense, which we were, were we will get to in a second. But if the Eagles offense can get going, who's going to be the big reason why they do? Um, well, I want to say Hurts, but you know that's kind of the easy answer for this one. I'm actually going to go with Kenny Gainwell. It seems mm-hmm. like in the early season that he's had Sirianni's trust with catching the ball out of the backfield. And if you're able to utilize him early in certain screen passes, maybe line him up out wide or give him passes out of the backfield to, you know, try to get this front seven off their game and get the ball out quick before they have a chance to get to Hurts. Like, for the love of God, I get you like to throw the ball a lot, Sirianni, but don't let Hurts just take a three-step drop back 45 times. Let him get those quick passes out to game well and let him make plays out of the backfield. I'm going to go with Kez Watkins, uh, and I just have a feeling he's about to ha- really have a breakout season here. Uh, you, you're starting to see it. Um, the dude can fly, mm-hmm. uh, a- as avid as. He, he posted a 4-3-5 uh, at the Combine before the NFL draft. He has hauled in 13 catches for a two for 267 yards. He's averaging a ridiculous 20 Point eight yards a reception. That is absurd. At least nice. the NFL, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, Watkins has that 91 yard catch on the season back against San Francisco. He had the 53 yarder last week against Carolina. Look for Sirianni in this Eagles offense to try to get him on Richard Sherman. Uh, Ross Cockrell is going to be in there as well. There, those are two slower cornerbacks, and obviously Jamel Dean as well is the third starting corner there. None of those guys are exactly lockdown corners that you can expect to keep up with a guy with the speed of Kez Watkins. Well, I think Devonte Smith, though he's probably the be- obviously the better wide receiver, he's a Heisman winner. Um, he is probably going to be working more in the intermediate routes, and I, I think Jalen Rager, it. it I mean, watch for the trade deadline. Who knows what's going to happen there? But the Eagles might decide to bring in a bigger bodied wide receiver like Allen Robinson, possibly hmm. um, to pair with Jalen Raker. We'll, we'll we'll see. We'll see if they decide to shop him. But I think my point is Kez Watkins is becoming wide receiver, too, I think, in a quick way. And I think if the Eagles break out and have some explosive plays, Kez Watkins is at the top of that list uh, for me this week. It seems like every game he makes one huge play and you're just waiting for that game where he just kind of has a full on all around huge impact. Yeah, I hope I hope he keeps it up because I I think that would go a long way with this Eagles offense to have some more plays open up for them, especially running the football. That would be a nice start. Okay, let's go to the Eagles defense. And obviously, when you think about the Bucs, Tom Brady. Right. Tom Brady, this Tom Brady that and we, we've all seen this song before. We know what Tom Brady could do. But the big reason to Tom Brady success this year is the set of wide receivers that he has at his disposal. This could be potentially the best offense that he's ever been a part of. I, I think it is. Um, they have three receivers, Matt, who are all on pace, which is just absolutely ridiculous to think about. Mike Evans, Chris Godwin and Antonio Brown are all on pace to have 1000 yards receiving on the season it feels like i wonder if that's ever happened before three receivers all with a thousand yard seasons it's it's absurd it feels like a lot of people think of tom brady at this stage of his career as a quarterback who gets the ball out quickly and yes that is true but the bucks get first downs on 43 percent of their pass plays which is second in the nfl and they're throwing it down the field only the Chiefs have a better percentage of pass plays resulting in a first down by 0.1%. The Bucks are far from a dink and duck team, and the Eagles defense has to be aware of the explosive plays. Mike Evans is a big-bodied receiver. AB just exploded on the Dolphins last week. Chris Godwin, I feel like, is the best receiver on that team. Um, they push the ball down the field. They can run the ball with Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones. Keep in mind, Giovanni Bernard can catch the ball out of the backfield. They can attack you in multiple ways. Um, prior, and I, and I bring back the chiefs matchup, right? 
Jonathan Gannon before that game talked about the need for the Eagles defense to defend every blade of grass because mm-hmm. Kansas City can beat you everywhere, vertically and horizontally. That's the Bucks offense too. Um, and, and obviously you saw what didn't work for the Eagles against the Chiefs. Hopefully they figured something out against the Panthers. And we all know how Jonathan Gannon preaches, don't give up the big play. And we preached about that against the Chiefs, how they look for that big play. Well, guess who leads the team or leads the – NFL in pass plays of over 20 yards this season. It'd be Tampa Bay with 28. What a big surprise. Um, yeah, going back, obviously you think of Tom Brady and, but as good as accomplished as Tom Brady is, he is still human. So he, that does mean he is beatable, but you have to pretty much play the perfect game in order to do so. And I think it starts with this defense starts with the front seven to try to pick up the momentum they had. In the, in the second half of that game and try to get as much pressure on Brady as you can early. When he's rattled, he's shown he can be human. Along with this, you have three incredible offensive choices. I think, in my opinion, like you said, Chris Godwin was their best receiver. I think it might still be Evans by a little bit, but I think Godwin is the most dangerous when you look at how much Evans and Antonio Brown open up the offense for him. So I'm looking at guys like Darius Slay and Steven Nelson to be able to play hard press man coverage, jam them at the line, and give their defense time to get back there. It's probably been one of the most effective styles against Brady throughout his career, and it is definitely going to be a tough task for John Gannon. But hopefully, takes that decent coaching second half and brings it more of that momentum. I keep using the word momentum, but in this case, when you're playing against Tampa Bay, you need pretty much any winning method you can get. It starts from momentum to execution. And we talked about the weapons that Brady has at his disposal. Not only that, but and you talked about how the front seven has to have a big game. This is probably one of the best offensive line in football that the Buccaneers have. Donovan Smith at left tackle, Ali Marpet at left guard, Ryan mm-hmm. Jensen at center, Alex Kappa at right guard, and Tristan Wirfs on the outside at right tackle. Um, they're all scrappers who are particularly good in the run game. I mentioned Fournette and Ronald Jones before. They do give up pressure at the middle in times. And I bring that up because Fletcher and Cox and Javon Hargrave, really this Eagles defensive line as a whole, the pass rush is coming off its best game. Fletcher Cox finally got a sack. Hargrave got a sixth. Kerrigan got into the fun. Sweat had a sack. Barnett played well. We often say in these matchups that Fletcher Cox and Jar- Javon Hargrave have to create pressure up the middle. That's kind of like saying the sun needs to rise in the morning. We know that. Um, but that's especially true against a quarterback that's not mobile like Brady. To your point, um, he look, he's not Usain Bolt, right? He's an outstanding pocket presence. Um, knows, knows how to make better s- than anybody. Correct. He knows how to make subtle but effective movement away from Ed Rutgers in the pocket. But he's we have we saw it in the Super Bowl. It takes a couple plays. You have to hit on the times that you get a chance to take him down and these receivers to not be able to get the ball in their hands and make plays because they will burn you. This defensive line has a tough ask this week but they're coming off their best performance of the season. They need to build on that. Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave will dictate a whole lot of the Eagles having a chance in this one. Yeah, like you said, it's a bit of a captain obvious approach to say that Javon Hargrave and Cox need to create pressure up the middle. But again, with a team with Tampa Bay with an offensive line as good as theirs, they need to create pressure up the middle. It's pretty much you need to negate the run game, make Tom Brady drop back, rely on your corners. to. You really need an all-around just perfect team performance against any team like this. You need to see your defensive line create pressure, contain the run as best they can. You need to see these cornerbacks, whether it's breaking the Mel Blunt rule a little bit, jam them at the line of scrimmage as much as you can, and just let your defense get back there and hit Brady. Get him off his game as early as possible, because once he gets into a rhythm, he doesn't leave the rhythm. Yeah, I, and we, we talk, we've we talked about the secondary a little bit against these receivers. Obviously, Slay and Nelson have a huge one. McLeod is still playing well. Anthony Harris played better. Um, we're starting to see Marcus Epps more and more. Jannard Avery has actually, you know, has been playing pretty well at times. And that leads me to, let's talk about these linebackers. The, the group as a whole is not good. We know that. We know these linebackers are not good. Missed tackles, failed gap integrity, blown coverages. I I mean, the list goes on. But Davion Taylor kind of put a little bit of a halt, tried to reverse the momentum a little bit. The Eagles are the only team in the NFL to have two linebackers with at least six missed tackles on the year, just just so you know. 
Um, so when you look at Davion Taylor, hopefully he could build off a career high 24 snaps last week, but don't be surprised if the Patriots game plan and they're that, I mean, Brady is better at this than anyone. You're going to see a heavy dose of the run game that has had surprisingly a lot of success against the Eagles. And that's not typically something you see against this Eagles defense, really going back into the beginning of the Jim Schwartz days, this, this defense does not give up. Uh, big running plays seems like every week the running backs are doing whatever they want, whether it be Zeke, Chupa Hubbard, uh, the combination of Elijah Mitchell. <laughs> I, I mean, it's just been ongoing. Um, Clyde Edwards Alaire ran for over 100 yards. Don't be surprised to see a heavy dose of Fournette and Ronald Jones and then some play action over the middle for the Bucks to get like Giovanni Bernard, Fournette open in space to see if these linebackers can wrap up. That's going to be a big key to the defense uh, forcing the Buccaneers offense to switch to a different game plan. I, I mean, that's Brady's bread and butter right there, and it falls mm -hmm. right into what the Eagles' biggest weakness is. It's been his bread and butter since he pretty much entered the game. And it really is going to be a tough task. Like, you know, I can even see it now here on Wednesday, just picturing in my head, like the routes are going to run. So it really is going to be a lot of, if these linebackers are going to be able to watch film and wrap up and make those tackles immediately and not let them break free for second efforts. All right. Let's go to the standout stars on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, we talked about a lot of the keys to – how to potentially limit the damage, uh, you know the Buccaneers' offense is going to get theirs. So that's not a secret. Um, but it's about making timely plays, and it's about limiting the damage to what the Buccaneers can do. If the Eagles do that, who helps them? Hmm. Yeah, it's a bit of a head. Like, I was even thinking going into, you know, when we were just talking a few minutes ago, I'm like, man, who would my standout starter defense be? I'm going to go with... Guy, I don't even know if I ever thought I would name on this podcast, but I'm going to go with Marcus Epps, and I'll tell you why. Because okay, all right. Darius Slay, for the most part, you know, he hasn't exactly been big play Slay, has been flashy, but he's been effective for the most part. He's been that limiting cornerback that the Eagles have needed. He's been able to limit his targets, and Brady's not afraid to take that check down, cut his losses, and throw it over the middle. So you're relying on these guys who are going to be working over the middle, moving all around the field to just wrap up and make tackles. And I think it starts with Marcus Epps, I think you're going to see him moving around a lot. Maybe he might have to help the linebackers in certain situations. So is he in, are he and those guys going to be able to make that wrap and cover and just tackle them right away and not miss tackles and not let them break away for big plays? You know, you're kind of uh, – we're, we're on the same way, uh, you know, mindset wavelength here because – I, I was going to go with Davion Taylor for kind of the similar reason. You saw his ability to close in in open space on Chuba Hubbard a lot last week once they finally got him into the game. And we just talked about, you know, kind of what Brady's bread and butter is as they rely on this run game. And then it kind of opens up. They're going to try to attack the middle of this Eagles defense, that intermediate area and try to get the ball into these receivers' hands, whether it be Fournette or, or Ronald Jones or Bernard in the passing game, or they go and set, keep in mind they don't have Gronk, whether it be Bright or Howard at tight end, Godwin or A.B. in open space. I mean, the weapons, they go on and on. Mm -hmm. But Davion Taylor is a guy that, I, I mean, he is a pass track star in college. He is very physical. He's raw, but it looks like he's starting to take that leap. If he can provide that boost on the Eagles defense and make some plays in open space, that will go a long way to limiting what the Buccaneers want to do. Because as much as the Buccaneers want to do that, they can make plays downfield. However, if they take away that intermediate route, Brady starts to struggle because that's not their offense. It really isn't. So again, with Davion Taylor, like I said before, I think he's probably – the most athletic linebacker, maybe the best all-around linebacker on the defensive side, just in terms of physical ability. So if he's able to continue to take that step, I'm really excited to see what he could possibly be for the Eagles, being a team that has just flat out ignored the linebacker position for what feels like, what, the last five, six years? <laughs> it's been completely ignored. And it, it I mean, for as long as this show has existed, Matt, even before you hopped aboard, Jeff and I, each and every week, we sounded like broken records. You need to address the linebacker's position. You need to address the linebacker position. I, I mean, look at the team that you're facing this week. Mm -hmm. Look at why they won the Super Bowl last year. It's because of the linebackers. Um, it, it's something that, especially if 
the top three picks um, or three of the top 10 picks, I should say, become Eagles picks, something the Eagles have to consider addressing it with one of those picks, if not two of them. Yeah. I mean, I think the last really deep time we had, like at least an inside linebacker position was, you remember the, the iconic trio of Michael Kendricks, D'Amico Ryans and Kiko Alonso. Yes. You know, you know like, Granted, Kiko Alonso, you know, can go kick rocks now. But look, you had a deep linebacking core there. You still had, you knew what your defensive line was. You were a backfield away from being an elite defense. Granted, Billy Davis is Billy Davis. But <laughs> you, you get the idea of what I'm saying. You're one yeah, four no, piece absolutely. right in the middle away from being one of the best defenses in the league. And whether it's going to be Davion Taylor taking that huge step, Eric Wilson starting to show his veteran self, or just cutting your losses and using a draft pick, on your weakest position. I mean, you're going to have possibly, like you said, three top 10 picks, depending on how the Eagle season goes out. And in a draft class that isn't exactly flashy at other positions you may need. Like this is literally like, it's a sign from heaven almost saying draft a linebacker, draft yeah. a linebacker, get your future all pro linebacker up the middle. I, uh, we are far, far removed from the days of Jeremiah Trotter, my friend. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> uh, it, it would be nice to see, even a guy even remotely close to a D'Amico Ryans or I mean Michael Kendricks, if he came back to Philly, he'd be automatically the best linebacker in the room and no questions asked, which is hard to believe. Um, but let's go to predictions, Matt. And this is going to be a tough one. Keep in mind it is in Philly. And anything could go in Philly, and you know, it's gonna be Thursday night. The Eagles have not lost on Thursday night football. They have they never haven't. lost on Thursday night football. So let's let's take that for what it's worth. Um, short week, Buccaneers coming off a blowout win. Can the Eagles pull off the upset, shock the world, and take down the defending Super Bowl champions, the 4-1 and one Tampa Bay Buccaneers at home? You know, um, they can. They definitely can. I, I, bro I don't know how many times I've broken this down in my head over the last week. This is a game that they can win. They can do it, but they really have to have the perfect game plan and all-around team effort. Like I said again, they can do it, but I think <laughs> on a short week against maybe one of the most well-rounded teams in the NFL, rookie head coach, a lot of young, experienced players, I think this is going to be a game where the Eagles struggle a lot, but you do see some good things at the end, so it's not a total loss. I think the fine, I think the Bucks will take this one by a score of, I'm going to say 30 to 16. Yeah, I think this is one of those games kind of similar to the Chiefs game. We're going to be sitting there and saying, well, what what the hell did you expect? You expect them to win this game? No, no, you didn't. But are we going to see the good things? Are we going to see progress from Jalen Hurts? How is he going to respond after last week? Yes, they won, but he did not have a very good game outside of the final 15 minutes. So let's be real here and realize that Hertz needs to have a better game this week. How is Sirianni going to call the place? Is he going to be more balanced? Is he going to run the football for Christ's sakes? Um, how is this defense going to build off of a very strong performance last week? So there's things in a young team that you know, this is not a Super Bowl team. This is not a team that you expect to win the division. Can they? Yes. D do the Cowboys probably need to stumble? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's a long season, and the schedule after this lightens up a little bit for this Eagles team. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say they're definitely going to make the playoffs, but even at two and four, the season's still in front of them. This is a big ask of this Eagles team. I think it's a team that has proven, and they proved last week, they're still buying what Sirianni is selling as a culture for this team. I, I think that, I mean, look, they're. They're really a couple mistakes away from beating San Francisco, uh, in, in my opinion. And really, they they just simply should have played better against the Cowboys and, and really sure. competed against the Chiefs. Like, it was bad defensively, but they competed with the Chiefs. So, like, there is really only one game this Eagles team definitely, absolutely deserved to lose. And that was that Cowboys game. So, this is a team that's been competitive all but one game. This is going to be a close game. Look, as much as I would love to say the Eagles are going to win this game, I have to be real here and realize this is the best team in football coming into the link to face a rebuilding birds team. Um, I, look, they're going to show the glimpses. I think we're going to take some positives out of this. However, it's simply too tall of an ask. The Buccaneers are going to win this one. I, I think it's going to be a little lower scoring on the Bucks side, I think it's going to be closer than some people think. I'm going to go 28-23 uh, Bucks, but nonetheless, both you and I 
take Tampa, but I, I think there's definitely ways to be positive about this without winning this game. I think so. Um, I, you know, while I still watch it, it might not be the prettiest game in the world, but the Eagles have an opportunity to either one shock the world or two compete and show what can still be there and build off a of momentum for the rest of the season or can show that they're a young team with some holes and that need to improve. So, you know, definitely a very important game for this team coming off of a short schedule. Absolutely. Short and week, that, say. yeah. And that, that sh- game is tonight. Obviously we record on Wednesday, but you're listening to this on Thursday game is tonight, eight o'clock at the link Thursday night football. Um, so go birds. Let's go to, um, Outside of the Eagles, the biggest talk of the town, Matt, mm. and uh, I, I'm pretty sure everybody knows where we're going with this. He's back. Ben Simmons is back in the building. He's in Camden. He's in Philly and on path to be cleared for action. And beyond that, uh, Doc Rivers did not reveal much on Wednesday after the team's practice about the future of Ben Simmons or what the plan is. According to Doc, he met with Simmons several times earlier in the week on Tuesday. Um, Obviously, if everybody remembers, Monday, Elton Brand got a text per Woj late at night saying Ben Simmons is outside the facility, ready to take a COVID test. Excuse me, what? Um, Mm -hmm. This has been the, I I mean, if this couldn't get more bizarre, uh, just quite simply the most bizarre I don't even know what to call it. It's not a controversy. It's not a, just a saga, just a, just a complete theatrical saga that the Ben Simmons um, story has been all year. Um, It it just took a weird, sick, twisted turn Mm -hmm. on all of us. Uh, Ben is back with the team um, per doc. He did all the stuff, all the physicals, all the testing, everything he needed to do. He's back in the evening. Uh, As we're recording, uh, uh, he's apparently having a workout tonight by himself. He has to pass all the COVID protocols, uh, and all he can do is individual workouts until he can rejoin the team eligible to do so Friday. Um, Whatever Ben's rationale is on this, whether it's, you know, to come back and play to show maybe to drive the value up. Maybe he wants to get paid. Oh, really? You have to show up for your job to get paid. Shocker, Ben. Wow. Or I mean, what a thought, Uh, or he just, you know, has a change of heart. I, I, I have been so torn on this that I don't even know what to say. Like Mm -hmm. I have to be angry at him. This entire city has to be pissed off at Ben, but what if he comes back and plays well proves that he improved his jump shot? I doubt it. Um, can make free throws. I doubt it. Uh, and then all of a sudden is, you know, has fixed all the wrongs with his teammates. I doubt it. Um, and, and, and leads this team like, look with the construction of this team, it's very similar to what led the Sixers to the top seed. The, mm-hmm. the, the nets don't even have Kyrie. They're not going to have Kyrie. If you think Kyrie's going to go get vaccinated and play this season, you're out of your damn mind. Mm -hmm. Um, The Bucs are beatable, but like the bottom line is, and this is where it just gets me, Ben Simmons makes the Sixers team better. We all know that. Mm -hmm. Um, What is it going to take, though, for this to all go away? I don't know if there is anything, but this – I don't even know where to begin on what the Sixers have to do to reconcile this entire situation. Is Ben going to make it better with his teammates? Is he going to apologize to the Sixers organization? Is he going to apologize to the fan base? Because that's what we are all owed. We are all Mm -hmm. owed in a deep, sincere apology from Ben Simmons. And then from there, Prove it on the court. The best cure in this city, and I will say Mm -hmm. this every single time, the best cure in this city is to win. Mm -hmm. If you go out, ball out, prove that you improved, worked on your jumper, decided and realized that you have to be a better team player and better yourself and go out and get this thing, you can fix a hell of a lot of wrongs, but you have to start by apologizing to the city and you have to realize that it is going to be a rocky road to start because 
you're going to get booed. You are going to be relentlessly booed no matter what you say to start off. I, I, I mean, Ben has to mentally realize what he's in for coming back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything that you just said is stuff that I've thought about since I heard about this Ben returning. But, just you know, just to hear you reiterate that, it just kind of brings it all back. And like you said, it's just been an absolute roller coaster. Like, you remember when the biggest problem in this, in this city was a guy doing sit-ups in his own driveway? Like I thought the T.O. This puts was nuts. This it, puts T.O. and McNabb to bed. Oh really my does. god! Like, and will Ben Simmons be booed during games? Like I honestly don't know about during games, but you better believe. Like when he's out there warming up opening night, or when fans first see him, they're gonna tell him how they've been feeling about everything that's transpired over this entire crazy summer of him one not showing up to the team, not talking to Joel Embiid, now saying he can't play with Joel Embiid. Now it's all of a sudden saying, Hey, can you let me in? You know, I, I want to come work out. Like, what? Like, where have you, where's that been the last how many weeks? So, granted, like Ben Simmons, you still look at all he's accomplished 24 years old, uh, all star, all defense. Yes, he does make this team better. This team yeah. is better with Ben Simmons in the starting lineup than, say, Tyrese Massey taking over out of the gate. And granted, He's going to have a long way to go to redeem himself. And then you want to know, like, is this the year? Is this the year he finally improved his free throw? Is it the year he finally improved his jump shot? You can be as great a player as you can be in the regular season. But when you get to the playoffs, it's half-court basketball. It's practically built around like it's half-court basketball. And Ben is not a half-court basketball player. So, again, like Stephen A. said, the best thing for this city, like, we're not asking him. We're not asking him to be perfect. We're not asking him to be the next LeBron, even though that's what everybody says he can be. We're not asking him to be perfect. We're asking him to show that he's made improvements and to put in effort to the basic stuff that you are right there, you know, that like a free throw and a jump shot. That's what stands away from you and being one of the best five, 10 players in this game. And can he do it? Is it the year he finally does it? I don't know, but it's going to be a very interesting first few weeks for this Sixers team because you got to you got to factor in the chemistry in the locker room, the chemistry between him and Embiid, him and Doc, Doc and the team with now him bringing Ben Simmons back. It's just going to be an absolute roller coaster to start the season. I don't know if I'm ready for it. In the words of Brett Brown, numb. No. <laughs> I mean, we are. It's just, it's just one thing after another. Um, we're, you know, the Sixers organization. There's nothing new when it comes to the level of of absurdity that has been year in and year out with this franchise. It's unbelievable. Um, it's it's just one of those things that we all have to buckle up and see. Obviously, when the show airs, we still won't have the answer. Friday, we will have a lot of the answers. Is he going to travel with the team for the last preseason game out in Detroit? Is he going to be in the starting lineup opening night? Or is this something that he will still I mean, there is still doubt that he will ever put on a Sixers uniform mm -hmm. again. Is this him just coming back and playing the Harden role? Like getting paid and being there, but he doesn't want to be there. And eventually this will be, you know, it, it, he will be traded. Um, there are a boatload of teams out there that have surfaced that are still evaluating, monitoring the Ben Simmons situation, hoping that they can pull off a trade. However, Daryl Morey, credit to Daryl Morey for not bowing down to Ben Simmons. And, you know, they called Ben's bluff and he caved in and here he is. It really is um, a big energy move to see from Morey. It really was nice to see him take charge and be that, you know, guy playing chess against an opponent playing checkers. So to see him in that situation – really handle Ben Simmons the way he did. And now seeing a spot where one of your big three guys is ready to show up after where I thought there, there's be so many times where it's like, all right, this is the night he folds. This is where he just cuts his losses and takes them for whatever. Give him credit. He's stuck to his guns. And here we are with Ben Simmons now showing up to tr like showing up to training camp and whether it's to actually try to make reconciles with his teammates or drive up his trade stock. We don't know. And we're not going to know for a while, but, it's better to see that he's actually showing up with the team and it makes other NBA teams because if the Sixers do still want to trade, it makes the NBA teams realize, OK, he is here. So he is going to play this year. We are going to see what he looks like on the court this year. So it's better than nothing. And I really do. Again, credit to Del Moore for just sticking to his guns. What is it going to take for you 
to forgive him? Um, it's a really good question. Um, the way I see it, because I don't um, know the answer. I, I don't, I personally I don't do know not know, but right now I think what I would say to at least, you know, I would want, whether it's his first press conference or an Instagram post or a tweet, you want to first hear him just address, you know, what's been going on with him. You want to see him apologize to the city, his fans and realize, Hey, I made an ass out of myself this summer. And along with that, show in game that he's taken strides and he's worked on his game and he wants to get better because this is a city of effort. So if he shows that effort and just apologizes to the fans, his teams, his coaches, and over time, maybe we can start to walk down the road to, I don't know if I want to say forgiveness, but maybe like reconciliation or just like, I don't know. We need to see to see him make a start. We need to see him make a start somehow. It, he's got to own it, up it, to it and make us like an honest and sincere start. It's like a disgruntled marriage where you're on the verge of divorce, but you're willing to go to counseling to see if you can make it work. I, that's where we're at with Ben Simmons at I this think so. point. That's a really good analogy. <laughs> that I look at it. Uh, I, look, I I think you put it the best way anybody could, um, because quite simply, I don't I, I don't know the answer to what it would take for me to forgive. Obviously winning does a lot of uh, a big is a big part of that. And obviously I, I think to your point, there does need to be some type of apology directed to the city, whatever happens in that locker room. Um, and with that organization is one thing, but you need to address this to the fans that supported you through the thick and thin um, and really had your back until you turned your back on us um that that's really where it starts for me so we will see how this uh really develops especially over the weekend um because for our next show we will probably have more of an answer of what the plan is moving forward with ben simmons because he will be eligible to rejoin the team we'll see if he joins the team for the final preseason game out in detroit and we'll see if he will be ready to rock for the season opener next week Let's go to, speaking of season openers, the Philadelphia Flyers, Matt. They're back, and they have a lot to prove this year. We talked about over the summer how they are an approved team. Uh, you and I have talked that we think they are going to have a bounce-back season. However, of course, they are in a very, very tough Eastern Conference. Uh, I mean, especially the Metropolitan Division is set up to be extremely tough, but this is a team that kind of rejuvenized itself. Um, you know, the, the it's a 21 man roster. They have a really tight salary cap situation. They won't have a healthy extra player at any position to start. Kevin Hayes is the lone extra player and could miss nine to 10 games more or less as he recovers from abdominal surgery. That's a big blow to start the year. Um, Hazy is obviously one of their better players. Um, but this is a team that still has talent, obviously led in net by Carter Hart. He has looked much better over the preseason. Martin Jones, the new backup there. And, you know, it was kind of eerie to hear Claude Giroux talk. He's talking as if this might be his last ride in Philadelphia, whether you want it to be or not. Um, they kind of re you know, reinvigorated this offense, Brandon and Cam Atkinson. You're expecting a lot out of Nick Abe Cabell um, brought in a bruiser and Derek Broussard. You, you claim Patrick Brown off waivers of Vegas. Joel Farabee needs to have a big game connect or a big season. Connect needs to have a nice rebound. Scott Lawton was a really nice player last year. Lindblom back uh, once again with a uh, extension after last season uh, van Reemsdyke is in the mix of course as well we didn't know if he would return he has nate thompson is back and then the defense matt i, I think this is going to be where you're going to see the biggest improvement this year um which was really the a lot of people were complaining with some of the moves that Fletcher made over the season. He brought in a lot of physicality, especially on the blue line. And I think it's going to show um, Ryan Ellis is probably one of my favorite moves uh, all, all off season long you pair with Justin Braun. You have even Provorov Rasmus Rista line coming in from Buffalo, I think is going to be an underrated move. God and Keith Yandel, who at this point in his career is not the Keith Yandel you can think of, 
um, or remember, but he is still a grizzled vet that wanted to come to Philadelphia and play for Elaine Vignot. So that, that is telling of him buying into what the Flyers are doing. And then obviously you have Travis Sanheim as well. This is a Flyers team that I think could surprise a lot of people. I mean, we had Stanley Cup aspirations last year after what they were able to do 2019, 2020, 2020, 2021 turned into a disaster. The Flyers are looking to change course once again. Yeah, um, it's kind of a situation, the way I see it, it's kind of like a ship that was dead in the water. You know, you knew where it was, you knew where they could get, but they were looking, Flyers, what they need to do is they need to change course, shake up the roster. I think that's what they did a lot. Uh, they traded away guys that were, they were in a situation where they were just trying over and over and over again, and it wasn't working. So I like them bringing in Cam Atkinson. They did dump some salary, granted that they are still not in the prettiest cap situation. But I think if we see a good upgrade from the specifically on the defense of this team has the potential to go be competitive. I think what we're looking for Travis connecting to take that big step mm -hmm. and really become that, you know, solid first line or first alternate kind of guy. You know, he made an all-star appearance for a reason. He's got a lot of potential, still a really young kid. And, you know, you know, Katuria just got that huge extension. So you want to see him live up to that extension. And hopefully if Giroux can still do his thing for what hopefully in my opinion is not his last ride here, but, could definitely be a very interesting season for the boys in orange and black. Yeah. And Elaine Vigneault is too good of a coach, um, you know, going into his third year guy in the flyers, he, he was runner up coach of the year in his first, uh, obviously last year didn't go so hot, but I, I mean, postseason is typically, you know, commonplace for an Elaine Vigneault team over his 18 years as an NHL coach, 12 have featured playoff bursts with nine of those advancing past the first round. Uh, this is a team that he knows how to get ready. And look, if anything, it's, it's just, they're in a tough division, man. I mean, you have Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. Washington, the Islanders are going to be good. Um, I truly believe the hurricanes are going to be good. The devils are going to be better. The Rangers are ready to take a next step. Hell, even the blue jackets might surprise people. There is not a team that you can really look at in the Metro and say, they're going to be, Bad. um, really, really bad mm -hmm. because I expect the devils to surprise people. So, uh, <laughs> this, this, this is a tough division, man. And the flyers need to, they need to start off. Well, typically what the flyers do is not start off well. And we're talking about that late push like January, February, March, them pushing into the playoffs. They need to reverse that course and, and start off. Well, they did. They started off well last year and then fell apart. They need to be consistent all year long. I think they're going to get more consistency in net. I think they're better on the defensive line. They need to stay healthy. Obviously, the Kevin Hayes injury isn't a great start, nope. but this this is a team, especially you know with with Couturier defensively as well. I think this is a team that look that they have the veteran leadership. Uh, I hope this isn't Giroux's last ride either, but. Um, time's really ticking on the Giroux era, and this is a team under Giroux's captaincy haven't made it past the first round. So this is something that – and that's hard to believe. I couldn't believe that when I saw it, but as Giroux's was not, captain – Was he not captain when they went to the Stanley Cup? No, Pronger was. Pronger was still. That's right. Man, that's crazy to think about. Yeah, Given, so, Like how long he's been here and where he's exactly. Like, wow, how about that? So, I mean, this is something where you want to see Giroux and this team take that next step. Finally, it's been frustrating uh, mediocrity with the orange and black for it seems like it. I mean, it really has been a decade not getting past the first mm -hmm. round, only really getting past the first round two years ago in the pandemic season, which I don't know if you can really mm -hmm. discount that know. or count that right it down and up, down and up. It seems like one year they make the playoffs, the next they don't. So it would be nice to see some consistency with this team this year. Um, I think they're set up to show that they can be consistent. However, they need to start off well, and that starts Friday. Um, you know, got to stay up late against the Vancouver Canucks. Start a West Coast trip to start the year. That's not exactly what it's I was actually looking actually a home game to start the year, actually. Is it? Yeah. Is it a home game? Okay, I apologize. Don't go to bed too late, but um, it will be a home game to start the season. Okay. So, uh, yes, so – We'll leave it at that. We'll obviously keep tabs on the Flyers. 
We'll keep tabs on the Sixers and the Ben Simmons situation as their season starts. It's going to be busy. And, of course, you have the Eagles tonight against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, the Phillies are sitting at home. They they brought in a new hitting coach, um, but they are re- just sitting there in the wings waiting for the offseason to start. Um, reports already coming out that they are going to be heavy uh, in on Craig Kimbrell. This winter, that would be a wonderful addition Mm -hmm. to what was a big weakness to the Phillies. But other than that, enjoy the game tonight. Go Birds. Trust the process as always. Go Flyers. Hopefully they start off the season well. Stay safe out there. This was made for Philly. For Matt Minton, I am Bryce Zielinski. We will catch you next week. Go Birds. Go Birds, baby.